I wanted to share some feedback that we've gotten. The book has been out since 2013. Um, and I think this feedback gives you know, a good sense of what the book is about if you're wondering. So you know, a great primer on, on metrics and analytics. That's nice. Um, you can't read it. Great. You know, differentiate from vanity metrics. That's kind of nice. I think this is pretty cool. You know, a good sequel to Lean Startup, if you've read Lean Startup from Eric Ries. I mean, that's quite nice. This is my favorite review of all time. Saved my marriage. What the hell? I don't know. Like, I got to meet this guy. I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's pretty spectacular. So that makes me feel nice. Truth is, you can't please everybody all the time, which is what that says. Total fail, 90% fluff. Like, fuck that guy. That sucks. <laughs> Truth is, for startups, though, this is actually a good, by the way, very painful for me. Um, but it's actually, it's actually good when you think about it from a startup perspective, because if you try to please everybody, you can't please anybody, right? So focus is just so important. Um, we're all familiar with this. The core of Lean is iteration. I'm going to assume everybody's read Lean Startup, right? Build, measure, learn. And in, in theory, this sounds like it's really easy to do. If you've attempted to put this into practice, it turns out it's a lot harder than we think. Why is it so hard to do build, measure, learn, even though it sounds, in theory, so simple? This is why. Because we're all liars. Why are we all liars? This is not my attempt to insult people. Please don't give me a one-star review that it was 90% fluff. The truth is, as entrepreneurs, we have to lie, right? We're creating something that doesn't yet exist. And to get up every morning and fight the good fight, you've got to kind of lie to yourself. You've got to kind of lie to your customers or your users. We put, as entrepreneurs, a reality distortion field around ourselves. Now, the real risk is when that reality distortion field gets so strong that you're running 100 miles an hour, you hit a wall, you crash, you burn, and you die. That's the problem with build, measure, learn. In theory, really easy. In practice, very hard to do. And that's, in fact, why we wrote the book. So let's take a look at this again. Build, measure, learn. Ideas, everyone has a great idea, right? Everybody in the room thinks their idea is the best. Nobody has a problem getting up at a whiteboard writing ideas. That part's easy. Building, everybody loves that part, right? A lot of developers, I assume, in the room, a lot of builders, product people. We all love building stuff. And there's a risk there, right, of building too much. That's what Lean tells us to not do. Here's where this starts to fall apart. Measuring, right? What do we measure? How do we measure? When do we measure? What's the right thing to measure? And in doing year one labs as a startup accelerator, as doing my own companies, this is where this concept starts to fall apart. And of course, if there's no data, there's no learning. So that's really why we wrote this book. This is the definition of analytics. It's the measurement of movement towards business goals. There are three words highlighted on the slide. Those, of course, are the most important words. If you don't know what your goals are with your business, what are you going to measure? You won't know. And what you're supposed to be measuring is movement, right? It's not measuring a point in time. It's measuring something over a period of time so you can figure out if you're actually heading in the right direction. And the challenge for most companies, particularly early stage, but this is true of all companies, is to pick one metric that matters. So this is sort of the, one of the thesis of the book. Um, pick one metric that matters for your business right now and focus on that metric. I will never tell you to only track one number. At Virage Sale, we of course don't track only one single number. That's impossible. Today it's easy to track everything. The question is what do you actually focus on? Pick one number and hopefully in the next few minutes I can show you how to do it. This metric will change over time, right? So as the company grows and evolves, pivots into different businesses, this metric will change. But the key is focus. So many startups fail because they try to do too much at the same time. Here's a quick slide about what makes a good metric. Um, it has to be understandable. People have a tendency to complicate metrics because we can track so much data. You should be able to say, here's what I'm focused on right now, here's what I'm tracking, it's super simple, everybody understands the business. Should be comparable, so typically we think about these things over time. Should be a ratio or a rate, so my example here of DAU over MAU or signups over retention, right? Percentages and ratios are inherently comparable. And um, finally, and most importantly, a good metric should be behavior changing. So this is the most important slide um, in my experience giving this kind of presentation is this one. If a metric won't change how you behave, it's a bad metric. Now what this means is, by all means, track everything. You never know when you're going to collect some data that you're going to learn something from. 
But if you look at a number and you say, if this number goes up, I don't know what I'm going to do about it. If it goes down, I don't know what I'm going to do. If it stays the same, I don't know what I'm going to do. Don't focus on that number. All right, so one of the ways to help you figure out what metric to track is what we call the lean analytics stages. So I'm going to walk through these stages with you. Um, and the key here is to really understand for your startup what stage you're actually at. Um, most entrepreneurs will lie about this to themselves. They will assume they're further down this path than they really are, right? It's nice to think that I'm all focused on growth, but if I don't actually have retention and stickiness, I can't grow. So a lot of people tend to skip these steps. Number one, empathy. So empathy is really about, I found a, a real poorly met need, right? This is qualitative in nature, not quantitative, right? This is when you're doing problem and solution interviews with customers and trying to figure out, am, is what I'm doing really meaningful to a segment of an audience, customers or users? Um, assuming you can get past this stage, most people, by the way, they say they do this, they talk to a few friends, they say, oh yeah, 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 what do you think about this? And of course their friends or their mom say that's an awesome idea, so they just run with it. Really think about how you're gonna do this process to really collect some meaningful qualitative information from people. Assuming you get through that stage, we move to stickiness. This is when you're building that MVP, that minimum viable product, and this is so important, right? So now the metrics are really about engagement. If you have a daily use case app, it's a DAU. Maybe you have a weekly use case. If you have a monthly use case, I get a little bit worried just generally because you can't collect feedback quickly enough. But here it's when you're saying, this group said this thing was meaningful. I built some small version of it to meet those needs. Is it in fact getting the usage that actually matters? Assuming you can get past stickiness, we go to virality. Now virality can mean a lot of things, right? So in the consumer world, we think about um, you know, that virality of one person sharing to another person, B2B sometimes has that if it's going bottom up. But this generally just means, can I start to acquire a broader base of, of users or customers through a variety of channels in a meaningful way? I'm not necessarily focused here on dollars yet. I'm not necessarily focused on cost of acquisition. I'm focused on, can I broaden my channels to acquire users or customers, and do those users or customers behave in a similar way to my early adopters when I was in the stickiness phase. Assuming you get past virality, now we focus on revenue. So you may have been charging from day one, right? B2B kind of application, maybe you're charging from day one, but you're not necessarily optimizing for revenue, certainly not optimizing for profit, right? Now we need to build an economic engine that actually works, right? So if you can get through all the other stages, now we think, okay, does the math make sense? Is my cost of acquisition reasonable compared to my lifetime value of my customer? Now we're really talking about dollars and cents. Is this working for me? And then finally, if we get past revenue, we go to scale. And the truth is, in startups, scale means anything, right? It could be um, you know, building uh, business development relationships, growing my sales team. It could mean partnering in different ways. It could mean launching APIs to let other people build on my platform. Scale means any number of things for any business. The truth is most startups, in my experience, fail at the stickiness stage. Now, what that actually means is that they don't build a product that's sticky, that's engaging enough. Now, most of those companies don't know they failed yet. They go past this, they go into virality and revenue. So they say, yeah, I'm not really getting the engagement I thought, but fuck it, I'm just gonna keep going anyway. Right? And eventually, that falls apart. Right? That's like a house of cards. The foundation is not solid without that stickiness. So the truth is, most companies fail at this stage whether they realize it or not. All right, let's talk a little bit about business models. So if you really understand what stage you're at, then the next thing you have to do is understand your business model. Now, business models are not just about how you make money, because a lot of companies start without um, a revenue model in place on day one, even much later than that. Um, this is about understanding the flow of users through their experience with you. So I encourage all um, startups to try to map this out. So I'll show you what this is a terrible slide, because it looks like that, right? Look at this crazy slide. This is the SaaS customer lifecycle. This is something we drew out for six business models in the book, right? This is absurd. Um, and so we're not gonna go through this, but the idea here is you know, this is what a customer through a type of SaaS business might experience, right? They come from some place, there's some acquisition cost, they're a visitor, they do a freemium or a trial offer, 
they enroll, they become a user, they convert, so on and so forth, right? So if you're just starting your business, you've just built an MVP, you don't care about paying customers, you don't care about upselling, you might not even care about churn right away, you just care about some of the early stuff. Is anybody even using this product the way I thought they would? So when you map this out, it, it, it's, it's not that easy, right? And we did six business models in the book. It turns out most companies are a blend of those models, right? I'm a mobile SaaS company. I am a user-generated content e-commerce company, right? So there's all kinds of blending of these models. You should put this on a whiteboard, look at it, and say, here's the whole flow and the whole experience of a, of a person or a customer or a user going through my business. That's your model, right? Um, and then figure out what point in here do I want to focus on based on the stage that I'm at. And that's going to give you that one metric that matters for your business. Oh, yeah, we, we're doing well on time. Um, let me give you just a quick example of thinking about which metric matters. This is an e-commerce company called Wine Express, right? They do a simple A-B test. Everybody knows that, what that is. This is the wine of the day page, right? It turns out A was the original one, converting reasonably well, but they, they tried this B version. So here's the results, 41% increase in revenue per customer, right? So when you look at that, you say, oh yeah, conversion, I might think of an A-B test and think conversion is all that matters, right? I, I increase conversion, sounds fantastic. But the truth is, conversion isn't the only metric that really matters here. What matters is people bought a lot more with that B. Conversion went up, revenue per customer way more important. So that's just thinking about what your metric is that really matters. Okay, last thing, lean analytics cycle. So remember build, measure, learn, and you know, in theory how simple and elegant that looks. We created sort of build, measure, learn with a lot more detail, focused on the data. Um, so first you pick that one metric that matters. So I'll, I'll use SaaS as an example, a SaaS B2B company, churn. Churn is let's say 10% per month, right? It's too high, right? I know I need to lower churn. The next thing I need to do is I need to draw a line in the sand. I've gotta pick my goal. What's my goal for churn? It's hard to find this number. Um, you know, what is the optimal, I mean, churn obviously would be great if it's zero, but let's say I've looked at industry standards, I've talked to colleagues, I've talked to investors, I've talked to advisors, I pick 5%. For me, at this stage, 5% churn would give me enough reason to go and focus on the top of the funnel and drive more people through it. So then I find potential improvement, right? So this is pretty easy. Um, without data, I make a good guess. So don't use, don't get caught in analysis paralysis with your data. Don't look at it all and say, holy shit, what do I do with all of this stuff? Take a guess, talk to your customers, say, oh, I think I can do this, and that will lower churn. If you have data, look for commonalities, right? Look for your best customers and say, why aren't they churning? What's different about them? And maybe I can learn something and apply that to changes I need to make for my other customers that are, in fact, churning at a too high a rate. Um, come up with a hypothesis. If I do X, Y is going to happen, right? So write that down, put that on a board. Everybody's focused on accomplishing that goal. Make changes in production or design a test, right? So sometimes you say, screw it, I'm just going to make a change, throw it up there and see what happens. Obviously, lots of testing you can do as well. Measure the results, that's straightforward. And then ask yourselves, did we move the needle? So churn was 10%, what did we get it to? Let's say we got it to 5%, success, we win. And we decide 5% is enough, like I said, to say, now move to the next thing. We think of metrics like squeeze toys. You focus on one thing, it's likely going to tell you what's the next thing you should focus on. If you've made the bucket less leaky, you can pour more people through the top of the bucket. Let's say churn stayed at 10%, completely failed, right? Whatever experiment we ran failed. That's going to happen tons. You can give up not something I would necessarily recommend on one experiment, you might be able to pivot, right? You might say, what I've learned is I didn't really move churn um, for one category of customers, but this other category, I did improve it. Well, maybe I need to focus on that category of customers and verticalize my SaaS product, could be. Um, you could draw a new line. You could say, you know what? I got churn to 7%. It's not what I wanted, but maybe it's good enough for now to move to the next step, right? That's a judgment call that you're gonna make talking to your users, talking to your customers, and figuring out if the value is there to justify moving to the next step. Or more than likely, you're gonna try again. You're gonna say, I got churn, 17 seconds, I got churn to 7%, I'm gonna try more experiments and keep going. More than likely, of course, you're gonna go through this cycle multiple times just for churn, and then you're gonna say, now let's go focus on acquisition costs and run through that cycle over and over again.
So I'll leave you with this. Once a leader convinced others in the absence of data, we looked at a leader and said, well, we don't have a lot of data. What the hell do we do? Somebody just said, we're going to do this. Go for it. Now a leader knows what questions to ask. And that's it. Thank you very much.